In this exercise, we will learn about the main differences between the Drude scattering time and the quantum lifetime. The expressions for these two scattering times are given in the exercise, um, and I've reproduced them here. This is the Drude scattering time, and this is the quantum lifetime. Just to remind you what these different terms mean, both have a prefactor ni, which is the impurity density in the doping plane. They have a prefactor m star divided by 2 pi h bar squared, which is the spin resolved density of states of carriers, telling you that if you have a large density of states, your scattering rate will be high. And then there follows an integral over scattering angles phi from 0 to 2 pi over the matrix element squared of the Fourier transform of the scattering potential. And in case of the Drude scattering time, there's this interesting additional factor of 1 minus cosine phi um, that makes it different from the quantum scattering time. Now, before we uh, enter a detailed discussion, let us briefly look at the wave vector Q, which enters um, in these scattering times in the matrix element. Q is also related to the scattering angle. So you see the formula also given on the exercise sheet down here. So if the scattering angle phi is zero, then the cosine would be one. This factor gives zero, so Scattering angle zero means Q is equal to zero. On the other hand, if the scattering angle is pi, then cosine phi is minus one, and one minus minus one gives four kf squared. Square root of that is two times the Fermi wave vector, so the maximum value of Q is twice the Fermi wave vector. And this is the case uh, of complete backscattering. Scattering angle pi is complete backscattering and the change in wave vector q is then two times kf, the Fermi wave vector. Now, um, in order to see uh, the difference between these two times, of course, we essentially have to ask why is in one case a factor of 1 minus cosine phi in the integral, while in the other case we don't have this factor. Now, if you think about it, probably the more elementary lifetime is the quantum scattering time. The quantum scattering time is calculated under the assumption that you have a particle, an electron, in a given k state at the Fermi energy. And now you're interested in the question, on which time scale does it leave this k state and scatter into any other k state available in the system? You see that this quantum lifetime has nothing to do with occupation. You assume that a k state is prepared and you ask, what is the time scale on which it decays into another k state? And you don't ask whether this other k state is actually empty. Okay? In this sense, this is a purely um, single particle scattering time, which is calculated using Fermi's golden rule. On the contrary, the Drude scattering time, as we learned to know it, is a relaxation time of the Fermi distribution function of the non-equilibrium distribution function that arises under the influence of an electric field, and it tells you how long it takes until this distribution function relaxes back to the equilibrium Fermi distribution function. And in order to, for this to occur, we had to consider two processes, namely scattering out processes and scattering in processes. By this we mean uh, the factor of one came about from scattering out processes. So you think of a particular case state and you ask what is the probability or what is the rate at which electrons scatter out of this case state into other case states. This is completely equivalent to the 
question answered by the quantum lifetime. And you see, if we had just this factor of one, the two times would be identical. Now, the difference comes from the fact that in looking at the relaxation of the distribution function, you also have to consider scattering in terms. And these scattering in terms from any state k prime into state k, these gave rise to the cosine phi factor that we see back here. So to sum this up, the difference between the two time scales that was uh, asked for in the exercise um, is that the Drude scattering time is a relaxation time for the non-equilibrium distribution function to return to the equilibrium Fermi distribution, while the quantum lifetime is a purely single particle scattering time that gives you the lifetime of a case state irrespective of any occupations of these states. Now, the second part of the first question is whether we can explain intuitively why for short range scattering potentials the ratio of these two quantities is close to one. And how do we expect this ratio to change for long range scattering potentials? Now the range of the scattering potential must somehow be hidden in the Fourier transform of this matrix element. In fact, if you think of a scattering potential in real space with a large extent, with a large decay radius, and you Fourier transform it, then you will get something which is quite sharp in Fourier space. On the other hand, if you consider a short range scattering potential in real space with a very small decay radius, then the Fourier transform of it will be a very long range function in Fourier space. This means in particular that if we have, let's say, an, a delta scatterer in real space, the Fourier transform will be essentially flat in Fourier space. And then there is essentially no Q dependence anymore. So this matrix element will not depend on scattering angle. We can essentially put it in front of the integral and we are left with only this term. Now this term will favor backscattering. So when phi is equal to pi, then this gives a factor of two, a weight two to these scattering events, while it suppresses forward scattering. So if phi is close to zero, then cosine phi is close to one, and then this difference is close to zero. So forward scattering is suppressed, backward scattering is enhanced compared to the case of the quantum lifetime. Now, in case where V of Q is essentially independent of the scattering angle because it's short range in real space, the favored backscattering will exactly compensate for the suppressed forward scattering due to this factor. And the scattering time tau zero will be unaffected by the one minus cosine phi factor. And then it becomes equal to the quantum scattering time. On the other hand, if the potential is long range in real space and therefore short range, very sharp centered around Q equals to zero in Fourier space, then forward scattering suppression will affect the integral very strongly such that the scattering rate, through the scattering rate, becomes very small compared to the quantum scattering rate. And then the ratio of the two becomes very large. The through the scattering time divided by the quantum scattering time ratio becomes very large. So this is how we see qualitatively that um, this ratio of these two time scales tells us something about the range of the scattering potentials uh, in real space. Now let's proceed to an attempt 
to um, see this quantitatively by choosing specific models for the impurity potentials. The first model I would like to use is the model of a Gaussian potential. Um, we call this special cases. So as a first case, we consider the matrix element V of Q squared, averaged, to be equal to a Gaussian function, which is given by 1 over 2 pi square root of 2 pi um, delta Q squared. And delta Q is the width of uh, the scattering potential in Fourier space times the exponential of minus Q squared divided by 2 times delta Q squared. So you see this quantity delta Q plays the role of a spread in K space and we see it as a tunable parameter in our scattering potential which we will then insert into the two expressions for the lifetimes. Now a short ri range potential in real space will give a long range potential in Fourier space so delta Q will in this case be very large and vice versa if we have a um, a long range potential in real space delta Q, Q will become very small. Now all the solution of the remaining exercise consists essentially of a numerical implementation um, for solving this integral or these integrals and then calculating the ratio between the two times. So essentially we realize that Q is given by this expression which is proportional to the Fermi wave vector such that the whole exponential depends essentially on the ratio between Fermi wave vector divided by delta Q or delta Q divided by Fermi wave vector. Now the numerical integration could be performed in either Python or in uh, programs like Mathematica or MATLAB and uh, I have shown the result of the um, Gaussian scattering potential here as the blue curve. So this is the result for the Gaussian curve. So what we see here is that for short range potentials in Fourier space, delta Q being small down here, compared to the Fermi wavelength or to the Fermi wave vector. The ratio tau q to tau zero is very much suppressed, meaning that tau zero, the Drude scattering time, is much longer than the quantum lifetime. So we see this because here we have an exponential scale for the radius, uh, for, for the ratio, and uh, here we also have an exponential scale for the ratio between delta Q and Fermi wave vector. Now, as this ratio increases, there is a critical value, delta Q over Kf, which is approximately one or close to one, where this curve bends over into the limiting behavior where the ratio tau Q to tau zero becomes one. And this is the case of the uh, large values of delta Q, meaning a short range scattering potential in real space. A second variant of uh, matrix element we want to consider here is the matrix element which would result from a screened Coulomb potential. You can find this in the book on semiconductor nanostructures um, to be given by matrix element Vi 
of q squared is, and let me now say proportional to, because we are not interested in prefactors because they will cancel in the ratio of scattering times anyway, um, is given by the exponential of minus two times q times d, where d is the distance of the doping layer from the 2D electron gas in a remotely doped structure. And this exponential is divided by um, a screening term in Thomas Fermi approximation, which essentially consists of Q plus Q Thomas Fermi, where Q Thomas Fermi is the Thomas Fermi wave vector, which is given by 2 divided by the Bohr radius in this spe specific material that we consider. And we have to take this uh, squared. Now if we take this matrix element and implement the integration for these two quantities, we will get the red curve that I've depicted here. And this essentially shows you that the behavior is very similar to the Gaussian case. Just the numerics, the, the absolute values differ a little bit. And there is a slightly differing limiting value for high um, um, values of k Fermi times s. So s here corresponds to d in my formula over there, right? We replace this by d. So the limiting value here uh, can be analytically calculated. It's essentially given by pi minus 8 thirds divided by 2 thirds, which is approximately 0 0.7. So the prediction, analytic prediction for the screened Coulomb potential um, is that the ratio of quantum lifetime to Drude scattering time is approximately 0 0.7 in the limit of short range scattering potentials. So if d, the distance of the doping plane to the electron gas becomes um, uh, s sufficiently small. Now in the opposite case, if d becomes very large, k Fermi d to the power of minus 1 becomes small, and then we have the same slope as for the Gaussian, so a strong reduction of the ratio tau q divided by tau 0, meaning that the Drude scattering time becomes very long compared to the quantum lifetime. Now from this exercise you essentially see that if we are able in an experiment to measure the Drude scattering time and the quantum lifetime separately, we will be able to learn something about the range of the scattering potential in real space. And this is indeed possible by measuring the Drude scattering time using the classical magnetoresistance, so Hall resistance at small fields and longitudinal resistance at small fields. This allows you to extract the Drude scattering time as we did in a previous exercise. And when we measure the evolution of Shubnikov de Haas oscillations as a function of magnetic field, we can determine the quantum scattering time, the quantum lifetime. So having an experimental access to these two quantities, we have experimental access to the range of scattering potentials in a realistic sample.